Okay, for the next section, we're going to start talking about plant diseases and infections, and we're going to start with viruses and viroids. But first, we're going to talk about uh, some of the pioneers, or one of the pioneers in microbiology, and that is Coach. Coach's, Coach came up, or Koch, Coach came up with these postulates, or this way in which you can definitively, definitively determine that... Um, a certain pathogen is affecting the host and causing its mortality. Okay, so it has to go through these. If it passes this test, then you can attribute the disease to the microorganism. So the microorganism must be present in all cases of the disease. So if you have this characterized disease of, in this example, we have rats. Um, all of them that you find that have this disease have to have the microorganism within them. Okay, and then it has to be isolated and grown in culture, taken from that culture in pure culture, so there's nothing else in there, and then reinfecting a host, and it also must cause the same symptoms of death. And then finally, after death, it must then be isolated again uh, from those um, experimentally injected um, hosts that you isolated from the first time. Okay, if you do those four things, uh, then you can say, okay, this bacteria or this infectious agent is causing this disease. All right, so a little bit about viruses, because that's what we're going to talk about today. They kind of, and I like this description because I've never heard this before, but this is the way your book states it. They represent the interface between biochemistry and life. So we kind of define life as things with cells. Um, and viruses don't have that. They also lack a cytoplasm or cellular structure. So they're very basic in their structure. They can infect hosts. They are very dependent on hosts. They cannot um, reproduce outside of a host. Um, but they do have some aspects of what we define as life as well. They don't grow. They can't increase or divide. All they can do is kind of hijack um, a host's enzymes to reproduce their DNA and proteins. They do not respond to external stimuli. They cannot move on their own. They cannot carry independent metabolism, so they can't um, break things down and use them for energy. And inside living cells, they express their genes and use their cellular machinery to produce more virus particles. So um, they kind of just float around, diffuse through fluids or through the air or through their hosts, find cells which they can inject their uh, DNA or RNA into and then um, are able to insert those genes and have them replicated and make new viruses within their host. So here's a papavirus in a human wart. You can see lots and lots of um, little ones all stacked together. They're about the size of a large molecule, 15 to 300 nanometers. So proteins, um, some proteins uh, approximate the same size. They consist of a nucleic acid core, so it can have a DNA or an RNA surrounded by a protein coat. So here's, these are all proteins and the DNA and RNA inside of there. This is a bacteriophage example we have here. Um, the protein coat, coat varies. It can have a 20-sided head, so we have here, and then a tail. Or it can have, again, DNA, RNA, or both DNA and RNA inside. Um, and they can be classified according to the DNA or the RNA or whether they are single or double-stranded. Um, then also according to their size, shape, nature of their proteins, number of identical structures, and so on, or what they infect. So a bacteriophage is, is something that infects bacteria. That's what we have here. So a viral reproduction goes like this. It first has to replicate at the expense of their host cells. So the host cell is going to do all the work and it's going to reduce the ability of that cell to function. It penetrates, uh, so it attaches, penetrates to the cell interior. Here's the attachment. There's the penetration of the DNA into the interior. 
the DNA or RNA dictates synthesis of new molecules, making new protein tails and heads and more RNA and DNA. And then the new virus is released from the host cell and the host cell dies. And then some of these can mutate very rapidly because they are just RNA or DNA and they don't have any enzymes to kind of check and correct. And that mutation allows them to um, counteract um, any defenses again that, against them, which is why new vaccines kind of constantly need to be developed to uh, combat their infectious ability. So a couple examples, or one example of, a very common example of a plant virus is called the tobacco mosaic virus, is a positive sense, so there are two strands of DNA, uh, one's positive sense, and that is what it also replicates. It's single-stranded, and it is an RNA virus, okay, so it just has RNA. It affects tobacco and other plants in the family Solanaceae, and it causes distinctive modeling and discoloration of the leaves, so that's what you see right here. Okay, so here's the, it's very, it's rod-shaped. Um, this is the protein coat, and then there's RNA inside of it. It enters neighboring cells through plasma desmata, so once it gets into a leaf, it just kind of goes then throughout different cells through those connectors of the cytoplasm. And vectors, so going from one plant to another, include aphids and leaf hoppers. Okay, so these plants are the distributing, or these plant-eating Insects can help distribute them, disperse them to other leaves. All right, another more simpler infectious agent is called a viroid. A viroid is a circular strand of RNA that occurs in the nuclei of an infected plant cell. Um, and it is transmitted from plant to plant by pollen, ovules, or other machinery. And it causes more than a dozen different plant diseases, one of which is called potato spindle tuber viroid. Again, this affects other potatoes and other plants of the Solanaceae family, including tomatoes and peppers. Um, and it was the first viroid to be studied by plant uh, pathologists. What it does is it causes stunted growth. Sometimes it doesn't really do anything, depending on how uh, prevalent the infection is, but it can you know, lead to, so here's three different stages. This is kind of more advanced. The eyes of the potato are very visible because um, it has constricted growth in the rest of the tuber. Um, and this one, you can see deformation of the of the potato as well. All right, that's it. We'll do bacteria next time.